academic research study focusing on how algorithms can take over management functions, right? And we actually analyzed the case of Uber, but uh, this case study will, um, yeah, we can abstract from this case study, and they're actually quite interesting findings that can be trans, you know, kind of, can be used to make sense out of our other technology-mediated contexts. So this is actually a joint study with uh, researchers from all around the world, Tel Aviv, Miami, and the University of Virginia, and myself, I'm based at Warwick Business School in the Midlands. So actually, I live in London. It wasn't too, it was easy <laughs> to get here this morning. Um, yeah. So, but I would like to start by um, asking you to please picture your boss, right? Maybe a former boss, maybe your current boss. Picture your boss. Think about conversations you've had, had you know, like negotiations. I don't know. Maybe um, you shared, you know, um, information about your family, you know, about your wife, and so on. And now imagine your boss is actually an algorithm. So most of you would now say, well, that's unlikely to happen. And I would answer, it's not, right? Actually, Uber uses algorithms to manage three million drivers worldwide, right? So Uber implements what we call algorithmic management to really use an app to manage all these drivers in a very efficient way. And why is that interesting? Why is that novel? Like due to recent advances in digital technologies, algorithms these days, they do not only provide decision support, but due to these advances in big data, in machine learning techniques, they can take over quite sophisticated tasks, such as those that have previously been conducted by middle managers. So in our study, um, we actually um, try to understand how algorithmic management works in the context of Uber. So we conducted a multi-method study in New York and London by interviewing drivers, by um, you know, observing drivers, by accessing selected public dialogue. And I think you're all quite familiar with the case, right? So who of you has ever used an Uber before? Well, most of you. So. <coughs> Um, I think these uh, findings may, may be, not, not all of them may be super surprising to you because you've probably been in the situation where these Uber drivers complain a lot, right? They complain about how the company is treating them, how they feel they're very isolated in, this, in their car, right? Having the opportunity to talk to no one except the customers they serve. So we actually identified three major tensions there. So what I'm going to do in this talk is really to focus on the potential downsides of digital technologies and applying digital technologies or using digital technologies in the context of human resource management. So the first major tension or challenge we really identify in the data is that um, there's constant surveillance, right? So Uber drivers um, experience a lot of flexibility because they can choose to work whenever they want to, they just log into the app. But once they're locked on, uh, once they're locked into the app, every move is surveyed. Every second, the GPS location is tracked, right? Whom they pick up is tracked. Like how many customer um, kind of requests they neglect or not, right? So every second of what they do is tracked by the system. And um, this morning, um, one of the speakers, um, she, Pipa, she actually talked a lot about surveillance, about um, the fact that huge companies, the huge tech giants such as Amazon and Facebook, they are tracking all of our data. Yes, they do, because we like content online, right? So we like a Facebook post, or we shop on Amazon. Yes, all this data is kind of gathered together, and then inferences are drawn from this data to target us, for instance, with personalized marketing. But in the context of Uber, it's quite different, right? Why is it different? Because the company needs real-time data. 
but you cannot go back to, to data, like where was this driver, like where was this driver placed like three weeks ago, for instance. You need real-time data to really come up with a very efficient matching mechanism that is in a very efficient way actually matching supply and demand of customers and drivers. So we, um, in our data, we find in our study unveils that drivers felt very unsatisfied about this really constant surveillance and um, they were even banned from the platform once they didn't really confirm with the performance criteria. So in case their rating dropped below a certain threshold, they were automatically kicked off the platform. And then this, um, this information about their performance that was collected with digital devices, devices, which is the Uber app, was actually enhanced by um, peer reviews, right? So for instance, the friendliness of a driver, that is something that the app cannot capture. So customers were used, used to provide additional performance information um, that then the Uber company used to really, um, yeah, um, to, to really manage their drivers. Okay, the second tension. The second tension is that there was very little transparency about how these algorithms work. And that was a major tension that these drivers experienced, right? So while Uber knows a lot about the drivers, it was really hard for the drivers to figure out how the algorithm was actually working. And um, that is, um, I brought you a quote here. So I'm not sure you're probably all familiar with Uber Pool. It means that if there are two people heading towards the same direction, they're pulled together in the same car, right? And um, Uber Pool is a very complex system because um, it led to the fact that it was almost impossible for the drivers to understand how their bill was calculated. So one of the drivers, for instance, said, well, when you pick up Uber Pool, you don't know how many miles you did with the customer. You don't know how to calculate the variable. You don't know how much he will pay. And that led to a lot of tensions. And if we abstract from this Uber case now, if we think about transparency, this is actually a key aspect in the context of using algorithms in, in, in HR. And we haven't addressed it um, today at all, if you think about it. And there are different kinds of algorithms, and I think this is really important to understand. On the one hand, they're very simple rule-based algorithms, and they can actually help to increase transparency, right? So for instance, in HR, if someone um, submits an application, um, there may be a very simple algorithm, okay, if you have this degree, if you have that many years of experience, yes, you're in the pool of potential candidates. Very transparent, very simple. You rule out potential biases, like gender biases. Well, but in this context of Uber, we talk about machine learning algorithms. They're extremely complex. A lot of data is fed into these algorithms and they are, in many cases, so complex that not even the data scientists who are sitting behind the algorithms know how they work, let alone the managers trying to manage the outcomes or outputs generated by this algorithm. And in the context of Uber, of course, they use machine learning algorithms, right? So they're extremely hard to figure out. And um, yeah, well, then it's, of course, a strategic decision if the company, in this case Uber or the army, um, wants to really um, yeah, be more transparent about the underlying logic of the algorithms. But this um, issue of transparency is really a major challenge that we see in many other contexts where algorithms are used in to make management decisions. Third tension is dehumanization. Just think about it, and this is actually some of the data I brought you, right? So these are pictures from our observations of Uber drivers in London. In London, you see the red bus right there in the background. <laughs> so the drivers, they talk to customers, yes, but they don't have a human supervisor to talk to. They don't have a team to mingle with, right? So they feel very isolated. They feel very lonely. So they were not very satisfied. <coughs> so, and we can see that these kind of dehumanization problems, we can observe them in many, many other contexts of distributed workforce or teleworking where people work from home. So, um, 
we believe that these challenges can be mitigated by providing workers with um, opportunities to mingle and socialize with supervisors or colleagues um, in, you know, at, at events or in other kind of work contexts, right? So if there's one work task that is very lonely where you're teleworking from home, the um, tensions of feeling dehumanized can be mitigated by providing social interactions um, if you think about other work tasks or, you know, like facilitating, for instance, social events and so on. So why is that a challenge? Why is the problem, a problem that in organizations have to think about and reflect upon? Well, actually, we found that Uber drivers, they were so angry, right, about this missing transparency and the surveillance and so on, that they actually, um, you know, they showed like very negative responses. We actually found that they were gaming the system. And this is um, our research, and we were actually featured on the front page of the print version of the UK Times um, last year. So what we found is that because the drivers were so angry, they got together, they got together in forums, in informal forums, and then they talked to each other, and then they planned to how artificially cause search pricing. And I don't know if you know what search pricing is, but it's actually a financial incentive that Uber has implemented, right? So, for instance, if there's more supply than demand, uh, sorry, so more demand than supply, so lots of customers who want to get a ride, but there are no Uber drivers around, right? Search pricing kicks in, which means that it's in financial incentives for drivers to serve a certain geographical area. So they gamed the system. They found, they figured it out. They gamed it by all driving to the same area, all logging out at the same time. Search pricing kicked in. They, they signed in to the system at the same time. There were a couple of seconds where they all got bings, bings, bings. You know, they were all matched to a customer for like an incredibly great <laughs> search priced fare. And they made a lot of money out of it. So they were gaming the system, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that well, my argument is that, that these kind of tension can lead to deviant behavior that actually hurt the company. So it's really important to reflect on that. So um, our research was just featured in the Harvard Business Review a month ago, and we came up with four management implications. So what can companies do to try to mitigate these challenges? First, share information. Be more transparent about the algorithms that you employ, right? To the extent you can. Um, second, invite feedback. Talk to the people. Are they really angry? angry? Why? Right? Uber is now um, getting better um, and you know, more social, offering so-called green light hubs where actually drivers can walk into an office and talk to a human being in case they have questions about how the algorithm works, right? But it gives the drivers the feeling there's someone caring for what they think about. Build in human contract. This is what I've mentioned earlier, right? Build in human contract. Um, every, we are all human. And um, the general this morning actually said, I think, I think, what did he say? People are the army. Right, so human contact, people, community feeling, membership. Um, this is, these are very human needs. Um, these are human needs that we also see in the workplace. And then the th uh, fourth one, build trust. And um, that's it, many thanks. <laughs>